Amen. How about a hand clap praise for our praise team? We thank God for them. And I owe a huge, huge, huge apology to our brothers in the Set Apart ministry, to my ministry. If y'all would show them some love and thank God yeah. for them. Amen. I failed to acknowledge them in the last service, but we thank God for them and thank God for their ministry. And, and we thank God for everybody that uh, has a hand in getting all these people prepared and everything. So God bless you, brother. Artists and your ministry. Um, how's everybody doing? Everybody good? Thank God for you. Uh, we will be continuing in our series on the battle within. And um, we will be coming out of the uh, book of Romans. Chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. Uh, if you could stand, in, stand for the reading of the word of God. Uh, we thank God for the opportunity to stand and thank God for our pastor. If you would say a, a prayer for him. Uh, he is, uh, he's not feeling 100%, but um, I was already scheduled to be up here today. So you would at least like for him to be able to fully enjoy his day off. So if you could just say a, a brief prayer for him. And um, we will read Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. Lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but pre present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. You are not under law, but you're under grace. And we'll be speaking from a, a topic of the choice is yours, so choose wisely. If you would please bow your heads. Lord, we thank you that uh, you reign on the throne. And Lord, that you uh, look down and, and you see us and you care for us. And so regardless of what we go through, we're never alone. And so it's times like these, Lord, where we want to take you serious. Lord, get to know you better. Get to know the things that you dislike, the things that you do like. Lord, everything that, you, that, that comes from the word of God, Lord, we know it's good for us and our walk with you. And so I just pray that seeds will be uh, planted on this morning, Lord, that we will be clear that you will speak through me. And Lord, that um, each and every person that walked through the door, Lord, that they may walk out of the door better than, than how they came. And so, Lord, only you can do that. Uh, it's not for my glory. Lord, it's not under my power, but it's for your glory and your power that we do this. And so we thank you and praise you and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The choice is yours. Choose wisely. Growing up, my favorite time of the year, as you probably agree, was always summertime. You know, you're not in, in school anymore. Uh, you get your time back. Nobody's waking you up early in the morning. You can kind of do your thing. And if you're like me, you probably didn't use your time as wisely as you should. I know I used to watch a lot of television, and so um, that wasn't doing me any good. But the good thing about summertime was on the weekends, you would watch your, your cartoons. But when summertime hits, you can watch those shows that come on during the day. And I used to love game shows. I loved them. Price is Right. My favorite was Press Your Luck, the one with the whammies. I might be a little bit too old for some of you young ones. Um, but yeah, I used to love that one. Uh, my mom was Wheel of Fortune. That was hers. Um, but me, yeah, I used to watch all of them. But there was this one kind of corny one I used to watch every now and then. But obviously, people must like it because it's still on now. And that's uh, Let's Make a Deal. Um, that one was, I, it didn't, I, I wasn't feeling that one very much. All those people in the crowd dressed up like all kind of crazy stuff. But uh, when I was studying uh, the text, it, uh, it made me think of let's make a deal because those people would be in the crowd dressed up in costumes and, and they would dress up in those costumes to get the attention of the host. And if the host picked you, you got a prize immediately. It was probably going to be like a mid-level prize, nothing, nothing crazy, but it was going to be something that you would at least appreciate and you might consider holding on to that thing. But they would also 
offer you the opportunity to trade that gift that you receive. And so they would possibly have, you may have won $500, and so the guy would come up to you and he's like, hey, you can keep that $500, or you can trade it in for what's under the box, or what's behind door number two. And so you didn't know what was behind door number two, you didn't know what was inside the box, but you had the opportunity to pick in hopes that it was more than $500. But what I would always wonder and always wish if I was on that show was I wish there was somebody who would be able to tell me where the big prize was. Someone who would be able to tell me where the treasure was. And the reason I thought of Make it, let's make a deal in relation to today's text is because as Christians, our lives are full of choices. Our lives are full of choices, and oftentimes we are fooled by the way things look. We're fooled by the people that have uh, influence over our lives, and so oftentimes we make some poor decisions based upon the way things look and how those things go. But Paul in our text today is showing us that we have a choice as well. Behind door number one, you have God and the Holy Spirit, and behind door number two is the flesh. And Paul, unlike the people on Let's Make a Deal, is showing us in the text which one we're supposed to be choosing, and I'm sure it's obvious to all of us it should be door number one. And so today we want to talk about the choice is yours. Choose wisely as we go through this series uh, called The Battle. Within, there's a choice that we have to make on a daily basis. Are we going to yield to the flesh or are we going to yield to the spirit? And so Paul is trying to tell us to present ourselves to God and not yield to the flesh. So the first thing I'm seeing in the text is this. Y'all help me out with that first one. Anybody in the sound booth? There we go. Go back. Amen. The wise choice is made based upon the biblical truth of your new life in Christ. The wise choice is made based on the biblical truth of your new life in Christ. When you see verse number 12, it starts with the word therefore. And so if you've been here long enough, you know if you see that word therefore, that's a transition word. And so you need to know what was talked about before the therefore in order to get what comes after the therefore. And what's happened and what we need to to, to know in order to truly get a, a good understanding of verses 12 through 14 is what Paul has laid out in chapters 1 through 5. Paul is laying out the facts and and the details of salvation. Uh, You may have just a uh, 2D sort of view of salvation. If you only knew just a little bit of salvation through chapters 1 through 5, Paul is going to add color. Paul is going to add depth. Where it was 2D to you before, it's 3D after Paul finishes his explanation of salvation. He talks about reconciliation. He talks about justification. He talks about uh, your depravity. He talks about all the things that go into your salvation. And so one of the things that I wanted to point out is chapter 3 because he talks about just how far off we were from God before our salvation. So go to Romans chapter 3. Verse 9. And so in Romans chapter 3, verse 9, it says then, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. So none righteous, meaning none of us were right with God before salvation. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks God. So none of us were looking to be saved. So we weren't, we weren't right with God, and none of us wanted to get with God. And so if we keep moving, it says, all have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good, not even one. So there's nothing we could do to please God. So that's how far off we are. And if you continue on, it says, their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So we were unrighteous. We were powerless. We were self-seeking. We turned away from God. 
and we had no ability to please him. All of those things add up to the simple fact of this, that all of us were headed to hell. But then Paul comes back in chapter 5, and now he introduces the beauty of salvation. If you go to chapter 5, verse 6 through 11, so that was the bad news, and Paul has given us some good news here in chapter 6, in verses 6 through 11 in chapter 5. It says, for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So we were far off from him before, but now as a result of Christ's death on the cross, God reaches out and now brings us back to him, and we're now together back with God. So through that reconciliation, we can have a relationship with him where we were powerless. Now through the Holy Spirit, we have power. Where we didn't relate to him, now through the Holy Spirit, we can please him. We can understand his word, we can take that word in, and we can live by his word, and we can please him with our lives. And all of this was done through his grace, by his decision alone. We didn't want it, but he decided to love on us in that way. So Paul is saying, as a result of this great salvation that we receive, our living ought to be different. What we were before we got saved was like a sports car with no battery. God made us, God made us, but we were empty as a result of the sin of Adam. And so just like a sports car, you could front with that sports car. It can be on your driveway. You can wash it. You can wax it. You can shine up the tires. You can take pictures on Instagram. You can front with that, with that uh, sports car. Folks will really think you're doing something. And folks, after a while, man, they'll be like, wow, man, he's tight. He got that nice, uh, he's got that nice sports car, but I don't ever see him drive it around. And you can just front and just be like, man, oh, I just came back from somewhere. Y'all don't ever see me because I work at night. That kind of thing. But that was us. We were a sports car with no battery. And ultimately, no matter how long you wax it, no matter how long you shine it, after a while, that thing is going to have to be thrown away because the parts get old. And that's how we were. We were empty. To give another example, we were like r cut roses. Ladies, whenever a, a, a fella uh, wants to, to, to make you happy, put a smile on your face, he hands you some roses, right? You like those when you go out on a date. But what he's handed you actually is a handful of death. Those roses are dead. They look great, but after a week, I don't care how many pills you put in that vase or whatever, those roses are going to die, they're going to wither, and that's what we were before Jesus Christ. But now, as a result of salvation, we've got the battery put in us. Now we have life. Now we can live for him. Now we can do the things that please him. And so Paul is simply saying, you've now received a graduated life through salvation. God's given you a double PhD, so why would you go back to elementary school living? God's done all this great work for you to receive salvation, died on the cross for our sins. So why would we now go back to the very thing that took us away from the fellowship with him in the first place? So he's calling for us to live in a graduated way, to take this gift that he's given us and run with it. Uh, why would we ever go back to elementary school living? Uh, I have some, I have two boys um, and um, at work one time, I have a, uh, a lunch kit, but it, I call it a lunch kit, but it's an adult container that you put your lunch in. I can't think of a better term for it. But I had this black deal I would take and put my lunch in, right? And so um, I would take that all the time. A friend of mine, somebody cooked for her, gave her some food. She didn't have none to take it in, so I gave her my lunch kit to take, right? So she takes it, and I think the dog or something must have got at it because she never brought it back. And so when I would ask her, I'm like, yo, where my, where my lunch kid? She's like, oh, I got you, I got you. So as a joke, she thought it was funny to bring me back an, an incredible Hulk lunch kit. <laughs> now, because of my boys were small at the time, I take the incredible Hulk lunch kit, 
And I take it to work with me. I show the boys, I'm like, y'all got y'all's? You got your Spider-Man? You got your Superman? I got my Incredible Hulk. Look. And it was cool with the boys. The boys loved it. But when I got to work, I would just leave that thing in the refrigerator, take my stuff out, and then go to the microwave so nobody would see. But ultimately, I got caught. And when I got caught, that thing was, didn't flow the same way it flowed with my boys. Folks was looking at me laughing. Folks was looking at me crazy. Why? Because a 40-year-old man shouldn't have an incredible, lunch, incredible Hulk lunch kit. And in the same way, God is looking at us funny because we're going back to old living and we've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. He's graduated us to a new level, so our living ought to reflect that. So we're alive to God in Christ, so our living should reflect that as well. And we are no longer dead in sin, so we're not obligated to the flesh. He says in verse 12, don't let sin reign in your bodies so that you'll obey its lust. The last time I was up, we talked a lot about the flesh. We talked about just how bad the flesh is, how the flesh is, is coming after you and the flesh is, is warring against you. The flesh wants to take you down. The flesh wants you to be in the same state that it's in and that's decaying and that's dying and bring death into your life. Paul's statement lets us know that the flesh is a present and a present yet old foe. So the flesh is coming after us. If, if the flesh were a wrestler, the flesh would be like Ric Flair trying to put you into a figure four headlock. The flesh is trying to take you down and make you submit to its will. That's what it means to reign in your body. It wants, the flesh wants to dominate you. And so it says in your mortal bodies, don't let sin reign. So when it says mortal, it's letting you know the conditions of the flesh. It's dying and it's decaying. I don't know if you saw this story in the news, but there was a building in New York and they, were, uh, uh, they had torn it down and they were going to put another building there. So they were clearing out all of the debris from this building that they tore down. So as they were clearing out some of this debris, one of the machines actually pulled out a human remains. And so they uh, took those human remains and someone actually threw, I don't know technology, what kind of skill, but they actually recreated the person who that skeleton belonged to. They had a picture of it through the computers did it, you know, based upon the size of the eye sockets and things about the skull. They were able to recreate that body. Now, during that process, one of the men said that they thought about quarantining the body from the, from the people because the body was preserved so well that what the, the person died from, which was like meningitis or something like that, they thought it might still be active in the body. That's how the flesh is to us, that we're carrying danger with us if we simply yield to it, but we have the Holy Spirit that protects us from that death, and if we follow the Spirit, we won't be in danger of the death and decay that the flesh wants to take us under to. If you want to see just how, just the, the, the results of what you can get from sin, go to verses 20 through 21 here in chapter 6. 20 through 21. It says, for when you were slaves of sin. You were free in regard to righteousness, meaning you weren't free in righteousness. You weren't righteous as one that's been uh, justified and declared righteous. You were free. You were outside of righteousness. And in 2021, 20, it says, therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things which you are now ashamed of? For the outcome of those things is death. So the only thing that you could ever get through yielding to your flesh and allowing your flesh to reign over you is death. If you want to see a picture of how uh, sin takes over us and how sin works in our lives and when we succumb to sin, all you have to do is think about the prodigal son. The prodigal son was enjoying all the benefits of his father. He enjoyed all of those many benefits that he, when he was living with his father. But he decided he wanted to go on his own and ask for his inheritance before the father even passed away. So essentially telling the father, I wish you were dead. And so he gets the money from his father and goes out and now squanders it. Now, I'm sure the parties were good. I'm sure everything was, 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 was live. I'm sure they had the, the drinks. I'm sure they had all of it. But ultimately, the money ran out. 
And so when the money ran out, that's when the party stopped. And so now he's gone from being a son of a good father to now being essentially a slave in the fields with pigs. So that's what happens with sin. It looks good on the outset. It looks wonderful on the outset, but the taste is bitter. And what it simply leaves for you is death. So the wise choice is made based on biblical truth of your new life in Christ. But also, I'm seeing this. This new life in Christ requires a new approach to avoid old traps of the flesh. This new life in Christ requires a new approach to avoid old traps of the flesh. Our old way of living in the flesh has led us to being misused and abused. In in verse 13, Paul says, do not present members, do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. To present, that means to yield. Uh, It means to appear before an authority. Essentially, that means you are going before someone who you claim to be ahead of you or over you for instruction. And so whenever we present our members to sin, you have now put yourself in sin's hierarchy. You are on sin's organizational chart, to say. And there's only two boxes. On the top is sin, and then under that box is yours. So whatever sin says, that's what you're going to be doing whenever you submit yourself to your sin and present your members to sin. It's just like in the military. If you were uh, the, under, the, the underbrother or the, the, the private, you would report and say private holiday uh, reporting uh, to, for duty. And so as a result of you reporting to whoever that sergeant or that leader is, He's now the one that's over you who's going to give you your commands. And so if you submit yourself to sin and present yourself to sin continuously, then sin will be the one that gives you your pecking orders. And so as we talked about salvation and what we've received through salvation and how valuable that is, why would we ever go back and present ourselves to the flesh for orders on how to live? And so I wrote down three things that, 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 that pop up in my mind as I thought about that. Why would we ever go back to the flesh? Well, number one is pleasure. It's simply pleasure. You think that what you're doing in the flesh brings you enough pleasure that, that I, I'll do this rather than follow Christ. But the thing about the pleasure, you add another layer to that. You're seeking pleasure, but it's really to mask pain. You're seeking these pleasures to do something that's trying, you're trying to fill some sort of void in your life by seeking these pleasures. Over and over and over again, you have to keep going back to them because there's a void in your life that you're not able to fill, but you're thinking that what you're doing in the flesh is going to be able to fill it. So that's number one, pleasure. And then number two, why we would yield to the flesh instead of yielding to God is uh, apathy. Apathy. You got saved, but there was no real follow up to it. You believed in Jesus Christ, but there was no 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 return to that thing and and, 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 and working that salvation out through Bible study and fellowshipping and praying. It's just you you accepted Christ and, and, and maybe you just fell by the wayside. And so whenever you don't demonstratively, actively go after Christ and submit yourself to him, you are demonstratively, actively Uh, submitting yourself to your flesh. You may not make the decision in your mind, I'm going to follow my flesh today. But because you don't follow Christ or seek Christ every day in your life and submit yourself to him, you are actively doing that. You're submitting yourself to your flesh. And then thirdly, and I think the biggest thing, is we're looking for validation and we're looking for value out of the things that we do. Uh, think about like like a promiscuous guy, like the the, the dude that you know the, the, he thinks he's the the one. Like he got to knock down every female that he meets, but he's doing that why? Because there's a void on the inside. He thinks that makes him a man, but really and truly, just just still a little boy, just still a coward. Because there's no responsibility in that. That's that's easy. Get with one and move on to the next one. That's easy. There's no there's no follow up to that. There's no accepting of responsibility to that. And so he's looking for some value, some validation in that. The same goes for the, 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 the promiscuous woman, too. Is that you're looking for value. But you, you don't want to be alone. And so, you know, I'll do whatever it takes, you know, so this dude won't, won't, won't leave. And so you're looking for value, too. And so the crazy thing is, I mean, even on the career, we do this for validation. Man, when you're on your career, man, you're working hard. You're trying to get, to, get up the, the, the corporate ladder. And, man, especially when you're African-American in the office, you don't, I ain't never had 
had an African-American boss. So you sitting here trying to be a pioneer and work all hard and everything, but you, don't for, you forget about your house. The kids, the kids looking for you. Mom's looking for you. So you forget all of those responsibilities. Why? Because you're seeking validation outside of what God is trying to give you validation through. That's what's so crazy is all of these different things that we talked about, why people go after the flesh, why people continuously do those different things, Christ supplies all of that for you. Think about it. God sends his only son to die on the cross. And so as a result of you believing in that, you get salvation. That ain't value to you. We just read the verses. It says folks won't die for another person. I'm not about to die for nobody. But Christ did that for us. So that validation that we're seeking, that, va that value that we're seeking, that's found in Jesus Christ. We don't have to try to find that thing. And so our old way of living in the flesh has led to us being misused and abused. And our new way of living in Christ allows for us to be used in the kingdom. Uh, as he says, present yourselves as instruments of righteousness to God. So present yourselves, it means to yield. It means to submit to authority, but it also means to place beside. And that paints a picture for me as far as how to view this thing about uh, submitting yourself to Christ is that you're laying yourself down at his feet like a dog to his master. Uh, that dog ain't going nowhere unless the master says so. Think about if your parents in the room, if you've got kids. Man, when the kids are little, they all about pleasing mom and dad, all about it. Now, when they get older, that's when all hell breaks loose. But when they're little, oh, man, they all about pleasing mom and dad. Like when they're with you, somebody could walk up to them and say, hey, what's your name? And they're, they're looking at you like, can I tell them my name? And you're like, yeah, go ahead or whatever. Tell them, no, tell them your name. Somebody could offer them a piece of candy and they love the candy. But they don't know them. They're with you. They're going to look right at you. And then when you say, go ahead and get that candy, they're going to go ahead and get that candy. That's how we're supposed to respond to Christ. That's supposed to be our response to Christ, that every day we wake up and we pray and we ask the Lord, what's your will for me today? That's where it's supposed to be. We yield ourselves to Christ. So what does that look like? Well, he tells us, don't yield the parts of your body, the members of your body. So when we think about some of the members of our body, you think of the mind, right? The mind, this sets the course for the whole body. You know, so the mind thinks that's what you do. And so a renewed mind allows us to be in God's perfect will. That's Romans, uh, two, Romans 12, verses 2 through 3. And so our thinking has to be changed for, our, for the rest of our members to be right. So whenever a man, the Bible tells us a man not to think it highly, too highly of himself, right? So if you're one of those types that thinks too highly of himself, what does that mean is going to happen with the rest of your members of your body? It's going to be all about how do I make myself look bigger? So the first thing that has to happen, we got to get our minds right and submit our minds to Christ. And then secondly, what's coming out of your mouth? What about our tongues? That little, that little member of your body can set a forest fire. So what are we saying? Uh, James 3, it says, uh, in James 3.10, it talks a lot about our tongue. So how are we doing in our speech? Uh, blessings and cursings can come from the tongue. And the tongue, when you think about unity in the body and us edifying one another, the tongue can strengthen the weakest link in the chain, or the tongue can also blow up the weakest link in the chain. What I mean by that is, if, think about somebody who suffered loss, loss in their family. And, and, and the Bible tells us to, to, you know, to commiserate with one another. Man, if one person is mourning, we're all mourning. Now, if that person is mourning over something and, and the best you got coming out of your mouth is gossip, that's not a submitted tongue to the Lord. And now you're blowing up somebody that's hurting. And then on the other side of that, when somebody is hurting and you've gone through that same thing that they've gone through, you could offer some words of encouragement. So now that weak link has been strengthened because of your words. So we got to submit our minds. We got to submit our mouth. What about the direction that we're taking in our lives? We need to be submitting our feet to the Lord. It's through the feet that we can stumble in sin. But it's also through the feet, as it says in Isaiah 52 and 7, how beautiful are the feet of those who deliver the gospel. So what direction are we moving with our lives? You know, how are we, how are we living? What, are we living our lives and moving in a direction where we're trying to grow in Christ, do ministry? Because the thing is, 
when we stumble in sin, oftentimes we stumble in sin because we have nothing to replace it. So you get saved and you don't do anything as far as Bible study, prayer, and all the things that God has laid in front of us for us to get closer to him. Well, then you don't have nothing else that you're doing that's going to replace the stuff that you've got over here. If you've got the drinking problem, the drug problem, and all the different problems, if you now take on what God has laid before you, you ain't going to have time to stumble on those sins anymore. I'm not saying that the flesh won't raise up and make itself known that, hey, I would like to go back to that. But what I'm saying is, if you're focused focused on ministry, there's not going to be as much time to focus on those sins that you've been going with. And then lastly, what about your hands? We work with our hands. We build with our hands. And so what are we working on? And is our focus on, uh, of the stuff that we work on, is it to glorify God with it? And if you want to answer, if you want to get a clear answer of that, all you have to simply ask, ask yourself is this, this question. How many people are impacted by the work that we do? How many people have been impacted by the work that we do? That's the question that you have to ask yourself whenever we think about the hands being submitted. So this new life in Christ requires a new approach to avoid old traps. And then lastly, we can always make the wise choice because our, of our new status in Jesus Christ. In verse 14, it says, For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So before the cross, man was under obligation to keep the law in order to achieve salvation. And there's 600 plus laws in the Bible. So the easy answer to that question is, no, you can't be saved because there's no way you were going to keep all of those laws. And so the way the law worked is that the law was meant to point out your flaws. The law was meant to point out what God likes, what God dislikes. And so as, you, as the law points out your flaws, the law does not have any grace within it. So the, laws, the, the law doesn't offer a used to be to sins. The law was simply, if you committed it, that's it. So there ain't no used to be drinkers. No, the standard is you're not supposed to get drunk, that sort of thing. So you're cut off. There ain't no used to be liars. You're not supposed to lie, so you're cut off. That's the law. If you want to uh, understand how the law kind of works, just to give you an example, um, my wife and I and the kids, whenever we eat, my wife has a pet peeve, and I have an unfortunate um, propensity to do this pet peeve. It gets uh, loud at the dinner table because sometimes I'll smack, slurp, that kind of thing when I eat. It's not on purpose. You know how we get comfortable at home. You kind of just, you just go at it. You being 100% you. Now, if I go out to eat with y'all, you ain't got to worry about me smacking and slurping. I never would do that. But at home, you just 100% you. And so as the man of the house, you sort of impact the culture of the house. And so the boys got a good dose of it, too. So whenever we eat, they get down, too. Uh, me, it really, it's me and it's Colton. Me and Colton, we the, we the ones. And so when, when we having a meal and it's good, uh, after a while, Dawn will be like, oh, I'm going to go eat somewhere else. <laughs> so the way the law works is this. A standard has been communicated. No smacking. The standard has been breached. Plenty smacking. And so as a result of the breach standard, there is a cutoff based upon the fact that she's now about to leave the dinner table. That's how the law works. You breached the standard. You broke the commands. Adam did it first. It, was, it got on us. But just to show you that it wasn't just Adam, it's you too. You sinned. All of us sinned. And so therefore, based upon the law, you were cut off from God. You were an enemy to God, as I read earlier. But that's the law. Grace doesn't work like that. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Grace puts sin in its place because we're not under Christ. Uh, he says, he promised us, he says, you're not mastered by sin. You're not under the law, but you're under grace. Grace establishes the new covenant. Grace is a free gift that we didn't deserve. So our salvation came through the avenue of, uh, of grace. We didn't do anything to achieve that salvation that we received. It was God simply saying, I'll give that to you, even though you don't deserve it and you could never pay for it. I love you like that. That's his loving kindness. It's unexplainable. That's how crazy grace is. God extends that to us. I mean, it talks about when it says in, in Romans that we're justified. God cleans our slate, 
takes all of our sins away, washes our sins away through the blood of Jesus Christ, and he determines us to be righteous, and it says in the text that we're unrighteous. But because Jesus said, you're righteous, we're righteous. We share, we're united with him, and therefore, because he's righteous, we're righteous. So grace is not a ticket to sin to show off, hey, we got, we've got grace, so we can sin a little bit more to show off grace. No. But grace simply is where sin leaves you hopeless. Grace inspires you to live holy because of the gift that you receive. Under grace, we can put our faith in God to help us with our sin. Now, let's return to the, uh, the dinner example. Now, through the law, you smacking at the table, that means fellowship with my wife is gone. She's leaving. But the example of grace is this. You're at the dinner table. You're getting down with the smacking and all that. And instead of the wife cutting you off and leaving, the wife says, hey, it's getting kind of loud in here. It's getting kind of loud in here. So now the standards communicated, the standards breached, but now you're helped with the breach standard instead of being cut off because of the standard being breached. That's the difference between the law and grace. The Holy Spirit's on the inside of you now. So when you breach the standard, you can go to God and ask for forgiveness. And not only do you receive forgiveness, but that power of the Holy Spirit on the side of you can work with you to keep you from breaching the standard in the future. So that's what grace is. That's how crazy grace is. And so lastly, we'll, we'll end this way and, 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 and close out with this. Um, I went to uh, Colton's basketball game. And um, y'all pray for him. He, he wants to be a doctor, so basketball ain't his thing, but he's in there. Um, I, it probably more so because of me, because I want him just to be in there. And so we went to uh, Colton's basketball game. And so uh, Adon got there first. And she said, you know, just call her before I get there, because uh, um, uh, sh she had this thing that I could get to get into the game free. My wife is on the board at the, uh, at the school that he goes to. And so therefore, because you know, she's on the board, there's benefits that come along with being on the board. And because she's my wife, therefore, I too benefit from being on the board even though I don't reach the standard of being on the board. It's my wife that achieved that standard. And so I get to the game, my wife comes down, and she gives me this gold card. So because you're on the board, you get this gold card. And so every time there's an event, you just simply show the card and you get in. And that's what grace is to us. Because if I didn't get that gold card, I would have went into my pocket. And I never carry cash. So therefore, I would have been fold, you know, thumbing around in my pocket, trying to find some cash, and then realize I can't get into this game on my own. And so that's what grace is for us. Grace showed us, look, you're not going to be able to achieve this salvation on your own. You're going to sin, and your sin's going to cut you off. But through grace, because of grace, now you can be reconciled back to God because that's how he loved us so. And so that's what grace is. It's our golden ticket to enjoy all of the good things that God has. That's all I got today. Um, let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, uh, Lord, thank you so much for your grace. Um, Lord, it's through studies like these that we understand uh, what the songwriter was talking about when he called it amazing. Lord, it is um, unbelievable what you've done for us. You would take your only son and put him on the cross for our sins, that you would take our sins and put them on him and exchange life to us. It, 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 it makes no sense as to how, but Lord, we just simply thank you uh, because we are recipients of it. And Lord, I thank you for the fact that there's folks in the house who may have never heard this before. And if they're hearing it for the first time, all they have to do is believe, and it's on them too, that they receive grace. And so we just thank you, Lord, for your patience. Thank you for your goodness and your kindness. And Lord, I pray that seeds were planted in this message, Lord, that we all might be able to, 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 to live from it and fruit might come from it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray it all. Amen. Amen.